Daniel chapter 1, in the 29th verse, you will find these words. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Our Father, we thank thee for the manifestation of thy presence that we are conscious of this morning. We are in thy presence. We do not have to ask thee to come, for thou art here already. Thou hast evidenced thy presence, and thy glory, and thy power, and thine anointing, and thy sanctuary upon the hearts of thy people. And now we pray that as we look into thy word, thou would settle just a little bit closer, and thou would touch the hearts of both preacher and people with that anointing of thy spirit that makes thy word have entrance into our hearts. And we will give to thee eternal praise and glory, for thou art worthy of it all. Amen. <clears throat> the subject of the Lamb of God is the central figure throughout the word. Of all of the types and of all of the metaphors that are used to describe the office work, the ministry of the Christ upon earth, there is perhaps no other metaphor or no other type that is used more frequently than that of the Lamb. As you study the word, you will find from Genesis to Revelation the reference to the Lamb of God. Matter of fact, as you study through the word, you will find a progressive unfolding of the doctrine of the Lamb of God. If you go back into Genesis chapter 4, you remember there's the account of Abel's lamb. In Genesis chapter 2, you have Abraham offering the lamb in place of Isaac. In Exodus chapter 12, you have the Passover lamb slain on that last night in Egypt. In Leviticus chapter 16, you have the sin offering lamb. In Isaiah chapter 53, you have the suffering wounded lamb. In John chapter 1, you have the sin-bearing lamb for the whole world. In Acts, you have the lamb is Jesus the Messiah. In the epistles of Peter, you have the lamb without blemish and without spot. And in Revelation chapter 5, you have the lamb enthroned in the New Jerusalem. And in the closing chapters of the book of the Revelation, you have the Lamb reigning in the new Jerusalem amid the new heaven and the new earth. If you would go back across and look at those scriptures just briefly again, you will find that there is a progressive unfolding or an a progressive expansiveness of the Lamb of God in the Word. You would note in the case of Abel, we are told simply that the lamb was offered. It was offered as a propitiation for sin. In the case of Abram and Isaac, in that particular incident, the lamb was offered in the place of one person, namely for Isaac. In the case of the Passover lamb, that last night in Egypt, each family was required to offer its own lamb. And so there you had the lamb for the family. In the book of Leviticus, in the typical ritual, on the annual Day of Atonement, we see the Lamb being offered for one nation. You go into Isaiah, there's the great picture of the suffering Lamb, the Messiah. He shall sprinkle many nations, which looks beyond Israel. Also in verse 8, he shall make many righteous, for he shall bear their iniquities. Here you have the Lamb for all nations. In John chapter 1, where John says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. You have the Lamb for the whole world. In Acts chapter 8, the Lamb is for each individual, not for the Jew only, uh, but also for that one who is a dark-skinned uh, Gentile Ethiopian. Uh, it's the Lamb for whosoever will, regardless of where they are or who they are or what their condition is. It's the Lamb for whosoever will, uh, regardless of the color of your skin, uh, regardless of what your ancestry may have been. It's the Lamb of God for whosoever will. In 1 Peter chapter, in chapter 1, it is the Lamb foreordained from before the foundation of the world. And there you have the Lamb for all of history. 
In Revelation chapter 5, you have the Lamb enthroned in heaven, and you have the Lamb for the whole universe. And finally, in the closing chapters of the book of the Revelation 21 and 22, where he reigns in amid endless glory throughout the new heaven and the new earth, we see the Lamb for all eternity. As you go back and put those all quickly together, you have, first of all, the Lamb for sin, the Lamb for one person, the Lamb for one nation, finally the Lamb for the nations, and then the Lamb for the world, the Lamb for whosoever will, the Lamb for all history, the Lamb for all of the universe, and finally you have the Lamb throughout all of eternity reigning supremely upon the throne. Hallelujah forever, I tell you this morning. No wonder John said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. As you study the Word of God, you will notice that the Lamb is referred to in various ways or in various methods. I, I notice there's a reference to the dying Lamb. There's a reference to the suffering Lamb, to the bleeding Lamb, the wounded Lamb, and the Lamb upon the throne. But of all of the pictures and of all of the thoughts that are suggested to us by the Lamb, there are three pictures that I would like to lift out specifically for our thinking together this morning as we think about the lamb. First of all, I would like to think with you on the picture of the wounded lamb in order for us to really get the picture of the wounded lamb. I believe it is necessary for us to go back into the 53rd chapter of Isaiah for the Old Testament prophet looking down through the telescope of prophecy and to that one who was to come gives to us a picture of the wounded lamb that is unparalleled. In this particular chapter, there are several phrases, all of which must be taken together in order to give us the picture of the wounded lamb. In verse 3, he is despised and rejected, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. In verse 4, he bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. In verse 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. As you go back through the Old Testament, and as the, old, as the lamb is offered upon the altar, the sin-burdened Jew feels somewhat better for this lamb represents that one who was going to come that would take away the sin of the world. And in the offering of that lamb, he has fulfilled the claims of the law. He has done everything that he possibly could do to be justified according to the law. But there had to be the continual offerings of the lamb again and again. But I want you to know that it was necessary for the blood of the lamb to be shed. For without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sins. Therefore, the wounding of the lamb was graphically symbolic of what the lamb of God must endure. I want you to note, first of all, there under the wounded lamb, where Isaiah says he is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. Do you not read that he came unto his own and that his own received him not? I suggest to your thinking to this morning that one of the greatest wounds that an individual could ever receive is not to be slapped in the face or hit with a fist, but to be rejected by someone that you love deeply and dearly and that you want to help desperately, but to have them to turn you away and to reject your love and to reject your offer of help. Jesus came into this whole world that he might lift mankind out of its sin and out of its suffering, but the Lamb of God received the wound, the wound of not being wanted. The scribes and the Pharisees rejected him. The people of Nazareth rejected him. The Jew in general rejected him. He did everything the Son of God could do to help his own people. But he was rejected and wounded by those of his own household. I think we get just a bit of a glimpse of the wound of the Christ on that last journey into Jerusalem for the Passover feast. As he comes around the bend of the path, Jerusalem waves before him in a panoramic view as he looks out over that city, a city that is rejecting their Christ, a city that is rejecting their Messiah, 
a city that is rejecting the one that was able to do so much for them as he looks out over that rejecting city amid all of the shouts of hosannas and the praises that are being raised by the multitude as they make their progressive way toward the city a high settles down upon that triumphant company because the master is weeping he's not weeping because of his impending death he's not weeping because of the fact that he knows that he's going to have to die he's weeping over a people that have had no time for him that have rejected him and have no place in their heart for him Do you listen to him as out of that wounded, broken heart there comes this cry, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often, how often, how many times did I want to gather you together as a hen would gather her chickens, but ye would not. I believe their hearts that man will never know the wound the Lamb of God suffered by his rejection and the despite was shown to him that he might provide the plan of salvation. But let's go on and look at the next picture that Isaiah gives us there on the wounded Lamb. He bore our griefs and he carried our sorrows. Could I suggest to you that individuals have died and been placed beneath the sod, not because they were shot with a gun, not because somebody put a bullet to their head or some other means of self-destruction, but because they died of a broken heart. How many times have you heard of individuals who passed away and it was said they died of a broken spirit and a broken heart? I tell you, the Christ was wounded for our transgressions. He carried our griefs. He bore our sorrows. He was wounded and broken in spirit as he did all that the Son of God could do for mankind. Wherever there was grief or sorrow or heartache, his heart was touched. Is it possible that the wound, the wound was even made deeper by the fact that as he began to think of what man could have been if he would have never fallen, if sin would have never entered into the garden, only recognizing that Satan had had a heyday in the lives of mankind, but the Prince of Peace had come to change the course of man's life and turn him about faith, but they were rejecting him. Then Isaiah gives to us that graphic picture. He was wounded for my transgressions. I cannot read this passage of scripture without making it personal. I know it includes you this morning hour, but I'm so glad it also includes me. He was wounded for my transgressions as black and as vile and as dirty and vile and dark as the pit of hell. He was wounded for my transgressions. The pure, spotless Lamb of God died for the sins of the whole world. Had he not suffered enough by his rejection? Had he not suffered enough by those who had denied him? No, no, it seems as though the cup had not yet been fully drained because that night, uh, under the light of the flickering torches, uh, as Judas comes and places the kiss of betrayal upon his cheek uh, and let off into Pilate's judgment hall, there's the mockery of royalty. There's the royal crown that is placed upon uh, his head that is filled with thorns uh, until the blood begins to run down his face uh, as they spit upon him until the spittle runs down his beard uh, until his back is bleeding and lacerated uh, from the kind of nine tails. Uh, but still he opens not his mouth. Why did he do it? Because he loved us. Uh, he was wounded for our transgressions. <sighs> And as he staggers his way up the Valadarosa road to Calvary, 
He reaches the place where his physical human strength will not carry him any farther, and he falls beneath the load. The nails are placed in his hands, and the spear pierces his side, and his head finally hangs limp to its side as he finally gives up the ghost. But in that hour there was opened a fountain in the house of David for all sin and uncleanness that is able to clean the pollution and the sin and the degradation and deprave depravity from the heart of mankind that is willing to come and drink at the fountain. Oh, hallelujah. Glory be to God and the Lamb forever. And regardless of who you are or who you were or where you came from, you can know the blessed joy of sins forgiven. Glory be to God and the Lamb forever. It means it will take a man who has been a hippie and down in the depths of sin and it will turn him about face until you won't even know he's the same man. But it will also take a self-righteous church member and convert them by divine grace and put something in their life that will give them some power and some glory until they will be a force of the local church. Hallelujah. But I want to look at the second picture. Not only is there the wounded lamb, but there's the sin-bearing lamb. John gives us this picture in the lesson we're using for our text this morning. Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. It's interesting to note that people of all lands have expressed the need for a sin-bearer. Whenever missionaries have gone, into the most remote sections of this world where they never saw a white man or a missionary or ever heard the name of Jesus. They weren't among that group of people long until they recognized that down in the heart of that pagan heart was a desire to serve, to worship somebody that was able to lift that load of sin and guilt and condemnation that was on their heart. Some of them had already found him but didn't know who he was. And when the missionary began to tell them about the name of Jesus, they said, that's what happened to us. We didn't know who it was that had lifted our load. But that's who it is. It was Jesus that lifted the load. <sighs> Makes no difference whether it be the headhunter or the idol worshiper. They all witness to the fact that mankind the world over craves for someone who is able to deal with the sin problem and take away the guilt and the condemnation and cleanse the heart from that propensity to sin and to give them liberty and freedom. John one day was baptizing by the River Jordan. He was in the middle of one of his sermons on repentance and reminding the people that they had to repent. But he had been telling them, there's one coming after me who is mightier than I. He's so much greater than I, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and unloose his shoe latches. He must increase while I must decrease. And it seems as though John seemed to rejoice in the fact that he was coming and he was going to increase while he would decrease. And in the midst of one of his messages one day, he looked up and saw coming down the path of Jesus and the disciples. He stopped in the midst of his message and said, hold it, hold it, there he is, there he comes. There's the one I've been telling you about. There's the Lamb of God. Oh, hallelujah, that taketh away the sin of the world. You remember the Lamb of the Old Testament was only a type. But this Lamb of God was the Lamb of God. It was the time for the types to pass away and for reality to come. The Lamb of the Old Testament was furnished by man. The man who would come to the priest with his, with his offering. It could be a bullock. It could be a lamb. It could be a goat. But if he was poor, it might be only a dove. But he had to furnish the lamb and bring it to the priest. But this lamb was not furnished by man, 
God looked heaven over and over, and he said, I've got somebody that I'm able to give to this old dying world. It's the Lamb of God. It's my only son. Here's the one that will be the sacrifice for the sins of mankind. The Lamb of the Old Testament was perfect in man's eyes. When he would select that offering, he would look that lamb over for blemishes or for defects, and then he would present it to the priest, and the priest would look it over for defects and for blemishes, and only after the priest had pronounced it pure was it able to be offered as a sacrifice. But no man looked this sacrifice over. God looked the Lamb of God over. He said, he's perfect. He's my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. He merits an audience as far as you're concerned. Here he is. Here's my offering for the sins of mankind. You remember that the Lamb of the Old Testament only atoned for the sins of the one that was offering the sacrifice, but this Lamb was going to atone for the sins of the whole world. Hallelujah. And then I'm reminded that the Lamb of the Old Testament could not take away guilt. It could not purge the conscience. All it did was satisfy the claim of Old Testament law. But when this Lamb was suffered, he not only was able to take away guilt, but he was able to free from the law of sin and death and to purge the conscience and to thank God and the Lamb forever. There's a void, there's an emptiness where sin was, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. How many a night did I come home to pillow my head with a stinging conscience and a heavy heart until I bowed one night at an altar of prayer and allowed the Lamb of God to effect his will in my life. And thank God I was able to pillow my head that night with the conscious knowledge not only was my sins forgiven, but my conscience had been purged. There was now therefore no condemnation, for I was his and he was mine. Hallelujah. Don't ask me to explain the sacrifice of the Lamb of God, how it can atone for the sins of the whole world, for it's beyond my comprehensions. How my sins, though as scarlet, could be as white as snow, and though red like crimson should be as white as wool. But while I do not have to understand all of its mysteries to experience it, I'm glad I can have the experience of his divine grace in my heart and in my life and know the transforming grace divine. Until I can say with a songwriter, the load that once I carried is gone. Of all of my sins there remaineth not one. Jesus, my Savior, has ransomed me, bearing my sins upon Calvary, giving me glorious victory. My burden of sin is gone. Oh, hallelujah. The sin-bearing lamb, the wounded lamb. Glory be to God. But there's one more picture that I would like to share with you this morning before I close. That's the picture of the conquering lamb. In order for us to get a picture of the conquering lamb, we go over into the book of the Revelation, chapter 5. You remember it goes like this, who is worthy to open the book and to loosen the seals thereof. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open the book and to read the book, neither to look therein. One of the elders said unto me, weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals. And I behold, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb that had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes. He came and he took the book and out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals, for thou hast was slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred, every tongue, and every people, and every nation. And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, 
worthy, worthy, worthy is the Lamb to receive power and riches and honor and glory and strength and blessing. Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth on the throne forever and forever. I want to remind you this morning of a truth that you're already familiar with. When he cried, it is finished. He did not die to be no more. Hallelujah forever. Hallelujah forever. I kind of think that around that cross scene that Friday afternoon, every hound of hell was standing by and waiting with bated breath. And when he cried, it is finished and gave up the ghost and descended into hell, Satan no doubt thought, finally, I've won the final victory. But he didn't realize how totally defeated he was because when he cried it is finished and gave up the ghost, they did not take his life. He gave his life a ransom for many. And when he cried it is finished, those waiting angels that had had to stand back that could not minister to him went hurrying the way into the city to the father to say, Father, it's all over. It's finished. He's dead, but he's not dead. He's alive. Hallelujah. I don't know what happened in those hours from Friday afternoon until Sunday morning, uh, but the Word does give us an insight in the fact that he preached to those souls, those souls who were in Hades. Uh, and on, Friday, on Sunday morning, God looked down over the banisters of heaven and said, It's enough. He's been down there long enough. It's time for him to come out. And he looked down and he said to the devil, he's coming out. And the devil said he can't go out. He came into hell with all kinds of sin and with all kinds of degradation. And God said, oh, that's true, but it's not his sin. That's the sin of a world. That's the sin of a nation. That's the sin of an individual. Look him over. He's clean. He's pure. He's spotless. From the day he was born until the present day, he is pure. He is holy. He's the atonement. And about that time, Jesus stood up in the midst of hell and said, I'm going out. Glory be to God. And Satan said, but you can't take these with you. Oh, he said, yes, I can because that's why I died. My blood is available for them. I'm going out and they're going with me. Bless God and the Lamb forever. And he came forth, triumphant over the grave. He lives this morning hour. He's the conquering Christ of Calvary. I would remind you as the conquering Christ of Calvary, he has power to triumph over your life. He has power to give you victory where you have failed. He has power to make you strong where you have been weak. He has power to give you victory where the devil has constantly hounded you. Oh, bless God and the Lamb forever. He's the conqueror of El Calvary. He's the Lamb of God. He lives. He reigns. He's able for our need this morning hour. No wonder the songwriter said throughout time and in the sages, heights and depths of love so true, he alone can be the giver since he rent the veil in two. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, behold the man of sorrows. Oh, behold him in plain view. Love, he is, he is the mighty conqueror since he rent the veil in two. He's the conquering Christ this morning hour. He knows your need. He knows your heartache. He knows your heartbreak. He knows every weakness of your life. He knows everything the devil has hounded you with to keep you out of the victory. He knows every area that has been a stumbling block in your life. And bless God and the Lamb forever, he wants to help and give you victory in that very area of your life. He's the conquering lamb. And I count it this morning the highest privilege and the greatest honor that could ever be stowed upon a mortal man to be called one of his children. One of his own is all I want to be. Where he may lead, I'll follow on. Oh, neighbor, this morning, if you don't know that, if you don't know this wonderful grace, the conquering lamb is here to give us the victory.
Has he really ever conquered your life? Has he really ever conquered you? If he hasn't, he lives this morning and he wants to conquer in your life and give you a newness of life that you've never known in all of your life. If you but submit, our Heavenly Father, shall we stand together? We thank thee for the wonderful presence of God in our midst throughout this camp. In the fellowship of thy spirit, we thank thee this morning for the faithful Holy Ghost. We feel like exalting thee this morning hour and giving to thee praise and glory for thy wonderful person. We honor thee this morning. If there's anyone in thy presence who has never been conquered by the blessed Lamb, speak to their hearts this morning hour. Let this be the morning when Jesus would meet their deep need. We're going to sing just a verse of invitation hymn. Don't feel impressed to sing long this morning, unless the Lord would change the order. But if you have a need.